So uh, I can't tell you what a pleasure it is to um, introduce the most affable, cultivated, humanities-oriented, well-educated, fluent in Russian political scientist I have ever met. <laughs> Um, and for me to say such wonderful things about a, a political scientist, especially in this building, <laughs> is really something. Um, I've known Bill Taubman for decades, and I've admired his and read his work for decades. Um, he's the well. He's got this title, Bert. Bertrand Snell, Professor of Political Science Emeritus. Um, he's been at Amherst, I think, sort of since the Truman administration, um, and um, has published many books. Um, so, <laughs> 1967, a book, uh, Soviet Youth and Ferment, The View from Lenin Hills. I'm not going to read all the books, but books on foreign policy, Stalin's American policy, Moscow Spring, written with his wife Jane Taubman, um, who's here. She's Professor Emerita of uh, Russian and Russian literature at Amherst, um, and uh, three different books on uh, uh, Sergei, uh, on Nikita Khrushchev, uh, and most famously, um, Khrushchev, or as they say here, you know, like they say, Boris Godunov instead of Boris Godunov. So um, Khrushchev, uh, the Man and His Era, published in 2003, which won a Pulitzer Prize, and he was last year speaking um, about that book. He's an extraordinary speaker and thinker, and he's the author of the soon-to-be-published Gorbachev, The Man and His Era, is that correct? Gorbachev, The Man and His Era. His and his life, life his life and times. Right, I, mean, I don't have that written here. This is from your bio. They don't even have the name of it here. His life and times. Uh, that's going to be published in September by Norton. Is that right? By Norton. Um, and then I actually just want to quickly read to you what he wrote, himself wrote on his Amherst website, because it's so charming. He said, one of the virtues of teaching at Amherst is that almost everyone is drawn into offering interdisciplinary courses. In my case, such courses have included totalitarianism, war, poverty, perspectives on the professions, national identity, and personality and political leadership. I think you probably love that last one um, especially. Besides being wonderfully stimulating in themselves, these ventures have the added virtue of enriching one's own specialized courses. He's taught Russian politics, rethinking the Cold War. Um, a seminar on Gorbachev, the end of the Cold War, the collapse of the Soviet Union, in which students um, joined me, that is to say, Bill Taubman, in trying to research and understand the arc and impact of Gorbachev's life and career, well as we'll see the um, impact of uh, Gorbachev's life and career was nothing less than really earth-shattering. Um, because it was so important in bringing about the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, for Russian Area Studies, this is our 25th anniversary lecture commemorating the 25th anniversary of the collapse of the Soviet Union, which happened um, at the very end of 1991, so just a little over 25 years ago. And I'm absolutely thrilled and delighted. Join me in welcoming Professor William Taubman, Amish College. Thank you. As a uh, somewhat senior citizen, I realize I have to find room on this relatively small lectern for my handwritten notes, since so it's not all on the computer, but I need the computer too, so I can press the button and put up some pictures. Yeah, life is hard, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I, hearing Nina pronounce correctly the, na the name Nikita Khrushchev reminds me that John F. Kennedy, made four mistakes when he pronounced the word Khrushchev. He talked about Cham and Khrushchev. And that has four mistakes in it. First, the accent. He had it on the first syllable. It should have been on the second. He said Khrushchev. It should have been for the first, uh, the beginning. And then it should be Khrushchev. He said Khrushchev. Uh, maybe that's three. At any rate, the, the correct, correct pronunciation of Gorbachev is easier. 
than Khrushchev. Well, it's a pleasure for me to be here. I'm very happy to be here with my old friend Nina Tamarkin. And some of you may know, many of you may know, an old friend of mine from Amherst, Howard Wilcox, sitting out in the audience, who taught math at Wellesley for many years. We used to play tennis, and Howard still does. Um, as you'll see in my talk, I'm going to be discussing Gorbachev a lot. And that reminds me that in my book, I have a page or two about the visit to Wellesley in 1990 for the commencement of Raisa Gorbacheva, uh, accompanied by Barbara Bush. Uh, it's not, it wasn't an earth-shaking event as far as the world was concerned, but apparently it was quite an event at Wellesley, and it was interesting, as I tell the story, as a window onto the character of, of Mrs. Gorbacheva. Well, let me tell you my plan for tonight's talk. First, I'm going to talk about various causes of the collapse of the Soviet Union. Underlying causes, immediate causes, more immediate causes. And I'm going to then talk about Gorbachev himself uh, as a person and as a leader. Not just because I happen to have written his biography, but because I think he played an absolutely crucial role in the events that culminated in the collapse of the Soviet Union. But first I want to begin with a kind of paradox. It has two parts. The first is that hardly anyone foresaw the collapse of the Soviet Union. Maybe almost no one. There is one person who I think can be said did. That was Andrei Amalric, who was a Soviet dissident, who in 1981 published a book called Will the USSR Survive 1984? And of course it did, but not much more than that. As for Americans, it's hard to find anybody who foresaw the collapse of the Soviet Union. Some people say they did in retrospect. I dare say that uh, Nina's uh, dissertation advisor, Richard Pipes, the great historian of Russia, then working for Ronald Reagan in the White House, foresaw, or at least would say he foresaw it. He tried to bring it about. Uh, he and other Reaganites credit Ronald Reagan with bringing it about by threatening the Soviet Union with Star Wars strategic defense initiative and running them, as it were, into the ground. I don't agree with that, and as you'll see, I'm probably not going to mention Ronald Reagan again in this talk. <laughs> now, the second part of this paradox is that this event, this world historical event that no one foresaw, once it happened and you start looking for the causes, they're all over the place. There are, ten, there are tons of causes that one can point to, many, many reasons. Not only why it happened, but why it had to happen. That is to say, why it may have been, some argue, that the Soviet Union was doomed from its very beginning in October 1917. Well, let me turn to some of these causes that one can point to before I well, you, actually, you're here. you'll hear as I'm going through them, you'll begin to hear Gorbachev's name, and then I'll turn to him especially. The first underlying cause, or theory, as it were, as to why the Soviet Union collapsed is a kind of abstract and philosophical theory associated with the late historian of Russia at Berkeley, Martin Melia. And in his book, he argues, in effect, that the Soviet Union, or the Bolshevik project, was doomed from the start because it was at odds with human nature. That is to say that the vision of communism, which inspired the Bolsheviks, or at least most of them, those who were not interested in power per se, and I think most of them were indeed interested in that vision, was a vision of heaven on earth, from each according to his ability to each according to his or her needs, was the slogan of communism as it was supposed to eventually come about. The idea is that this is impossible. This is just uh, contrary to human nature. And therefore, they had to resort to force to try to bring it about, since it wasn't going to happen naturally. But that force brought about, in due course, under Stalin especially, a totalitarian police state, which eventually, following the logic of this explanation, had to be reformed, especially after Stalin died. It had to be reformed, but the trouble is it couldn't be reformed because once they loosened the controls, once they 
ceased applying terror to compel uh, obedience by the Soviet people, the system inevitably fell apart. Well, just a comment on this particular theory. I think it's too simple. There are many turning points along the way when decisions were made or not made that could have changed more or less the path that the Soviet project was taken. And as a person interested in biography, and in particular the role of leaders who have a decisive effect, at least as I see it on history, I simply ask myself a question like, what if Stalin had been hit by a truck in 1925 and killed? Uh, that would have changed a lot, not everything. It would still have been a very cruel regime, but it wouldn't have been the Stalinist nightmare that eventually developed. What about some other basic causes? Well, one was the super centralized nature of the political economic system, which it has been argued clashed with the imperatives of a modern economy and of modern technology. The example that is always given is that science and technology cannot thrive in a closed, compartmentalized society, moreover one that's isolated from the rest of the world. By closed and compartmentalized, I mean that scientists working in one institute can't talk to scientists in another institute, and certainly Soviet scientists can't talk very much to American scientists. Uh, and so eventually economic growth was going to slow, and damned if it didn't and uh, technology was not going to develop and damned if it did, and pretty soon they would be lagging far behind and find themselves as they did in a period of stagnation which led Gorbachev to attempt the reforms which he did. Another kind of basic cause has to do with ethnicity and nationalism. The Soviet Union, I'm sure you know, was a like the Russian Empire before it, was a multinational enterprise consisting of Russians, Ukrainians, Georgians, Armenians, Balts, 15 republics, as it turned out, under the USSR. Now, Lenin was smart enough to play on the existence of nationalism to make the revolution, to attract supporters for it. And then he tried, again, very cleverly, probably too cleverly, to tame the very nationalities whom he had attracted to the revolution by giving them the appearance of authority. Their own separate republics, their own governmental institutions, their own flags, their own anthems. But the trouble was that this created a kind of time bomb, ticking time bomb. That is to say that in the long run, these nationalities who had been given all these accoutrements of authority were probably bound to demand the real thing, especially after Gorbachev took the lid off and allowed them to think that they could act democratically to get what they wanted. A third general kind of underlying uh, cause of the collapse of the Soviet Union involves the world it's beyond its borders, the international dimension. The Soviet Union was a great power, it was a superpower, or at least it thought of itself that way, and the world did too, in a Cold War with the West. But in the process of fighting that Cold War, it overextended itself in a battle with the much richer uh, West. Overextended itself geographically in places like Afghanistan, in Eastern Europe itself, for that matter. It fell behind the, so the United States in the arms race. It put a much bigger, uh, proportion of its economic resources into the military, shortchanged the consumer economy, shortchanged its people's lives, which was a recipe for the kind of discontent that eventually bubbled up. So if these are sort of general uh, causes, I now turn to what you might call more immediate causes. And here you begin to hear Gorbachev's name because he was crucial to unleashing some of these intermediate developments which produced the collapse of the Soviet Union in the end. One was the political liberalization that occurred under his rule beginning in 1985, which undermined the Communist Party, which had been the skeletal backbone of the state. 
Another was, another thing that happened was the division at the top in the elite, in the Politburo and beyond the Politburo, in which Gorbachev eventually found himself caught in the middle between hardline, well here I have to correct myself, I was going to say right wing. This distinction is often made between left wingers and right wingers, but it's a very bad term to use because it's, the, it's used uh, opposite of the way it's used in this country. That is, the left wingers at the time were the communists, but they called them the right wingers in the Soviet Union, and the right wingers were the liberals. Well, anyway, forget about it. I called them hardliners and, and, and um, hardliners and liberals and radicals. Anyway, Gorbachev found himself caught between the hardliners and the liberals in a way that split the elite and opened up the system to the disintegration that occurred. Now, two more even more immediate causes. These are particular events that took place in 1991 uh, and after which the system was probably doomed even though, according to Malia, it was doomed from 1917 on. But you can make the case that these two particular events really uh, cut it off at the knees. One was the famous coup, or attempted coup of August 1991 in which the hardliners uh, put Gorbachev under house arrest uh, and where he was eventually rescued by the hand of Boris Yeltsin, who thereby became really the dominant political figure, although it can be said that he was on his way to dominance even before them. And then the Ukrainian referendum of December 1st, 1991, in which the Ukrainians voted for independence dooming Gorbachev's attempt to turn the super-centralized, phony federation of the Soviet Union into a genuine federation, which uh, m might have happened if not for the coup and then for the Ukrainian uh, referendum. At, by the end, Gorbachev was trying to shoehorn eight, seven or eight of the republics, maybe even fewer than that, into what he was going to call the Union of Soviet, uh, of Soviet sovereign republics, getting rid of the word socialist, and he may have actually gotten rid of the word Soviet too. So much for these general causes, underlying and more immediate. Now, as I said, I want to turn to Gorbachev. And why do I want to turn to Gorbachev? Because I think this is a classic case of how one leader has a decisive impact on world events. Now, you may say that if you read the newspapers day to day in this country, you have the impression that single leaders have a decisive event impact everywhere, all the time, because the media spends so much time talking about leaders. And in general, uh, I think that can be exaggerated. But particularly in the Soviet Union, where power was concentrated in the hands at the top, uh, it turns out that individual leaders are absolutely crucial. The, Re the Bolshevik Revolution wouldn't have taken place without Lenin, who kept pushing for the seizure of power even when his colleagues, including Stalin and the others, said it's too early, too early according to Marx, to seize power. And then there's Stalin. Well, as I said before, it would have been a very, very cruel, brutal regime, but I don't think it would have killed off the millions that Stalin killed off. I would make the case that Khrushchev, too, in denouncing Stalin in 1956, and in the other thing he did that for which he's remembered, sending those missiles to Cuba, did things that nobody else would have done in his place. I think of all the lead Soviet leaders, the only one who acted, who did what other leaders would have done in his place was really Brezhnev. Because when you get to Gorbachev again, Gorbachev does what nobody else in the leadership would have done. So we have to talk about what he did, and we have to talk about his uniqueness, in part because that uniqueness, the fact that he did what others would not have done, is, a, is our invitation to try to understand him as a person, what drove him as a person to do what others with a different character and personality would not have done in his place. Well, what did he do? He initiated and led the fight to transform communism, which had been done by 1989. He, more than anyone else, much more than Ronald Reagan, there I did mention his name again, ended the Cold War. He uh, presided 
unintentionally over the collapse of the Soviet Union, but contributed to that collapse, which he had not wanted to bring about. And as I say, he was unique. He went much farther than his Kremlin colleagues who selected him in 1985, expected or wanted him to go. Uh, only two or three of them, Alexander Yakovlev, uh, Eduard Shevardnadze, and Vadim Medvedev stayed with him almost to the end in 1991. All the others broke with him or he broke with them. But th the reason they were able to do so was because he either put them there or kept them there. So in other words, you can't say simply, well, he had three people who did what he wanted to do. Well, they wouldn't have been there in the Politburo or they wouldn't have stayed there if he hadn't put them there or kept them there. I guess this is the moment when I could press the key on the computer, and there he is. This is the picture that I put on the cover of the book, and I did it because I think you get a sense of a, you get a sense of the man which is accurate. You get a sense of a man who is warm and strong and basically decent, maybe too decent for the role that he had to play. Uh, okay, now, what I want to do now is address three big questions about Gorbachev's life, which help us to answer the question of the role that he played in the collapse of the Soviet Union and why he played it. The first question is, how did a peasant boy, he was a peasant born uh, in uh, a village in southern Russia called Privolnaya, how did a peasant boy who won a school prize for an essay hailing Stalin become the grave digger of Soviet communism. And just for fun, I'll tell you what the theme of the high school essay that he wrote was. It was called, Stalin is our wartime glory. Stalin gives flight to our youth. The second question is, how and why did the communist regime put him in a position to destroy it? Given the fact that that regime had so many checks and guarantees to prevent somebody like him from getting into that position. The third question is, how did he go about trying to democratize the Soviet Union, and why did his effort to do so founder and fail? So let's go back to the first one. How did Gorbachev become Gorbachev? Well, he was born in 1931, and he grew up in a terrible time collectivization of agriculture with millions of victims, a famine, the famous famine of 32, 33, in which several of his cousins starved to death, the terror, the great terror of the late 1930s, in which both of Gorbachev's grandfathers were arrested and sent to prison, both somehow survived. And that's interesting because psychologists say as I've come to understand them, although I'm not a psychologist, that when uh, terrible storms turn out to have silver linings, and in Gorbachev's case, there were several of them, I'll tell you another one in a minute, this tends to encourage or in, in a person a sense that, of optimism, that things may yet turn out no matter how bad they seem to be. Uh, another terrible thing that happened was that the Nazis occupied Gorbachev's village for four months in 1942. And they apparently were about to arrest and probably liquidate his family because his grandfather, uh, one of them was the chairman of a collective farm and they were after communists like that, the Nazis were. And then before that could happen, they were driven out of his village. Uh, well, when I think about his childhood, I'm reminded of a phrase that Soviet school children were often encouraged or required to say during Stalinist times, and that was, thank you, comrade Stalin, for our happy childhood. And my point is that in its, in its own way, and I go into this in much more detail in the book, Gorbachev's childhood actually was happy. He says about his childhood, we were poor, practically beggars, beggars, but I felt wonderful. Well, why did he feel wonderful? And uh, here I won't go into much detail, but he had wonderful grandparents and wonderful parents, especially his father. There he is, 
as a boy with his maternal grandfather and his maternal grandmother. And I like this picture because of the little things like the hand on his grandfather's leg and their elbow or arms on his shoulders. And I think, I don't vouch for what kind of collective farm chairman his grandfather was. He may have been a brutal man. Most, many of them were. But, the, but Gorbachev loved him. He and Gorbachev's grandmother loved him in return. And I've read accounts which say, if they can indeed be trusted, that they were quite wonderful people. And now here's Gorbachev's father, Sergei Gorbachev. And I think you can see it again in the face. Maybe I'm reading too much into it. But I think you can see that as Gorbachev speaks of him and as others speak of him, he was a lovely man. Um, well, my point is that growing up in this kind of environment fostered in Gorbachev a kind of sense of optimism and confidence, which also may have come naturally to him genetically, and trust in other people, without which one can't really conceive his daring to try to democratize his country, or even uh, believing that it could happen because he trusted people to govern themselves. I don't want to reduce everything about Gorbachev to his parenting and grandparenting. And so I would point out that I think some of that optimism and confidence came also through, in a way, his identification with communism itself. Communists prided themselves on their ability to change the world almost overnight, as they thought they were doing in the 1930s. Uh, but whereas communists of the Stalinist type produced Stalinism, Gorbachev drew on what he saw as the original idealism of Lenin that he thought had been perverted by Stalin to bring himself to believe that Stalinism could be overthrown and that they could build, uh, well, in the beginning, communism with a human face, although I would argue that by 1990, 91, Gorbachev had in fact become a social democrat. Now, the next place in his, uh, in his evolution that I want to talk about briefly is Moscow State University, where I had the pleasure, although it wasn't always pleasure, of spending a year, 1965-66, as a graduate student. In fact, I was in the same department or faculty, law faculty, as Gorbachev, and I lived in the same tower of one of the, of the uh, skyscraper, the wedding cake skyscraper. Um, well, anyway, Gorbachev um, attended Moscow University, which, is, which was the elite university. So the question arises as to how did he get in there, and this is interesting too. He was a star student in high school. He won uh, the second highest award that the Soviet Union could give, the Red Labor Banner, for helping his father break records in harvesting grain. And he also managed to get himself uh, appointed a candidate member of the Communist Party very young. And here is a quote from what Gorbachev wrote in his application when he applied in 1950, when he was 19 years old, to become a member of the Communist Party or a candidate member. Quote, I would consider it a high honor to be a member of the highly advanced, genuinely revolutionary Communist Party of Bolsheviks. I promise to be faithful to the great cause of Lenin and Stalin, to divide, to devote my entire life to the party's struggle for communism. Well, how did he get in? Partly by writing stuff like that. But as he said later, he said this about himself. He, he said, I got in without taking an exam, without an interview, without anything. Nobody asked me a thing. Well, I'm saying this in part for you students out there who've just gone through this process yourself. Well, in my opinion, I deserve to be admitted. I was someone you could count on. And that's how it turned out at the university. Well, he didn't just get into the university. The university was a place where even in, under Stalin, who died in 53 and Gorbachev got in in 1950, there were some free thinkers around. They couldn't speak freely, but some of them were left over elder professors from before the revolution. Others had harbored secret thoughts. Some of the students had seen a lot themselves. And one of the people, perhaps Gorbachev's best friend at the university, 
was a Czech student named Zdenek Mlinash, who turned out to be, in 1968, the chief ideologist of the Prague Spring under Alexander Dubček. And uh, Mlinash has recalled what it was like being with Gorbachev and uh, you know, what kind of person Gorbachev was. And here is something from Mlinash's recollections. At one point together, they watched the classic film Cossacks of the Kuban, made in 1950, a Stalinist musical comedy. Yes, such oxymorons did exist, not only exist, but were wildly popular just when real life was at its worst. Anyway, in this film, happy collective farmers play joyfully bring in the harvest. It's not true, Gorbachev whispered to Mlinash as they watched the film. Gorbachev continued, if the leader of a kolhoz, collective farm, does not use brute force against the farmers, they would probably not work at all, unquote. In one scene, pretty blonde milkmaids in sparkling summer dresses, who have just won a socialist competition by overfulfilling their plan, storm local stores for their own harvest of prizes. Shoes, hats, candy, balloons, and even prepared to buy a piano for their collective farm. Pure propaganda, Gorbachev informed Mlinash. You actually can't buy anything. Uh, so this gives you a sense of what these people, they were, they were believers in communism, but they could see through the facade uh, and regret much of what Stalinism amounted to. And the university was also the place where Gorbachev met and married Raisa. There she is on the right. Uh, I'm going to tell you a bit more about her at the very end as a way of bringing the talk to a very sad conclusion. Okay, how did Gorbachev become the leader slash destroyer of the Soviet regime? Part of the answer has to do with qualities that he demonstrated as he climbed the ladder of the Communist Party in the city of Stavropol in southern Russia. He was smarter, better educated, more honest, less corrupt than almost all of his peers. Uh, now I'm going to quote from a woman who worked for him in those days, whom Jane and I interviewed on one of our trips to Stavropol. Her name was also Raisa, Raisa Basikova. Uh, and she told us that most of the men working for the party at that point were, quote, show-offs and extremists, not nearly as, quote, smart and solid as Gorbachev. Many of the men, she said, were crude and arrogant and took liberties with women, unquote, whereas he treated them with respect, in a, unquote. In addition, Gorbachev went out of his way to appoint women as city and district leaders. And lest you think that this was a rare case, I can recall a trip that I took with Khrushchev's son, Sergei, and his wife to uh, Ukraine, to Donetsk, which is now, of course, in eastern Ukraine under separatist rule. It wasn't at this time. This was 1991. And we had dinner in a cafeteria in a hotel with some party officials. And I remember to my shock that they downed 200 grams of vodka with breakfast and started chasing the waitresses around the room until they disappeared into the kitchen. I was, uh, well, I was surprised. I wasn't surprised, but, but I remembered it, as you can see, until this day. Now, Raisa Bazikova also said this about Gorbachev. He, she said his closest advisor was his wife. She said they were wonderfully, quote, open and sincere with each other. She was, quote, very smart, unquote, and he knew that and listened to her. He didn't trust many party workers, but he did trust her in everything. Even when the advice she gave him wasn't good, at least it was sincere. His aides, she said, just weren't on his level. That's why she influenced him on everything, including personnel issues. Uh, okay. So why did the regime uh, promote him? Partly because he was, as I say, smart, 
educated, and seemed to be a good man. Um, and in this, and behaving in this way, he impressed the hell out of Soviet leaders in Moscow who, and here's one of these accidents of history, who happened to vacation at resorts in the Northern Caucasus near where Gorbachev was climbing the party ladder. And one of those was Yuri Andropov, who at the, when he first met Gorbachev was the head of the KGB and later of course became a Central Committee Secretary and then leader of the Soviet Union until he died um, very quickly. Uh, and Andropov vacationed there. He got to know Gorbachev. He got to like Gorbachev. And here's a picture. This is one of my favorite pictures. A picture of Andropov. Oh, sorry. This is Gorbachev at about the time he married Raisa. Isn't that interesting? I, we, Jade and I talk about this. In this picture, he sort of looks like a French movie star. <laughs> and here is Andropov in the Caucasus Mountains taking a picture of Mikhail and Raisa. They would take hikes together, they would cook shashlik together, they would sing songs by a campfire together, and Andropov would actually sing songs of, of bards who were not in entirely good order with the regime. Andropov was a very complicated character who seemed to have some liberal instincts, but basically repressed them in order to do what he thought had to be done to govern this state. Well, it wasn't just um, Andropov. Gorbachev also met Kasigin, who was the prime minister, and Suslov, Mikhail Suslov, the uh, gray cardinal, the chief ideologist. None of these people were as liberal as Gorbachev turned out to be. Uh, but they were all involved in promoting him. Uh, they thought of him, these old men, as sort of representing these old men who understood how much cynicism existed all around them in the Soviet system, saw him as a kind of exception, saw him as, a kind of, as, as the best that the system could produce. So they helped promote him to Moscow in 1978, uh, and then, as, we, as I said, in 1985 to the very top, the general secretary. Why that last step to general secretary? because he was the youngest in a Politburo whose average age was well over 70, and because his immediate predecessors, Andro Brezhnev, Andropov, and Chernyenko, had been nearly dead men walking. And here I have a picture of one of them, Chernyenko, who could barely breathe toward the very end. Uh, they sort of propped him up in front of a voting booth on election day, uh, but you can see what kind of state of health he was in. So the colleagues chose Gorbachev because he was the youngest, because he, they hoped he would modernize the Soviet system, make it more efficient. Uh, they wanted moderate reform, but he gave them much more than that. Okay, how did he proceed to try to democratize the Soviet Union? Well, he didn't do so immediately. He started out slowly. His first major reform was the ill-fated anti-alcoholism campaign which was a disaster because it uh, not only alienated the millions of Russians who love to drink, but also undercut the subsidies from that, the sale of alcohol, which was a state-run monopoly, into the budget. Um, and yet this was his first uh, reform. Why? Because alcoholism was a terrible, terrible thing in the Soviet Union. And also this, you may not know, is interesting, Gorbachev and Raisa, his wife, both had younger brothers who were alcoholics, very serious alcoholics. Both, in effect, drank themselves to death. Another one of Gorbachev's early reforms that was not democratization was called acceleration. The idea was to accelerate economic growth and technological innovation, but it didn't. At the end of 1985, Yakovlev, Alexander Yakovlev, his close ally in the leadership, came to Gorbachev with a memo which included some of the following startling recommendations. The party must give up its leading role in the state. It must govern itself democratically. The state's legislative and executive branches must be separated. The legislature must become a working parliament with members chosen in competitive elections. The judiciary must be independent 
guaranteeing individual rights, including the right to property and freedom of personal communications. Workers must have a real voice in governing their enterprises. The country should have a president elected by the people from nominees presented by at least two political parties. This was the recipe that Gorbachev eventually followed. But what was Gorbachev's reaction at that time? Rana, too soon, too soon, premature. He did promote glossness, openness, which verged pretty quickly on free speech, but he held off, and it was only in 1988-89 that he took the steps that he had said were too premature in 1985. In 1988, the 19th Party Conference in June okayed mostly free elections in 1989 to create a working rather than rubber stamp parliament. And Gorbachev cut back drastically on the power and extent of the Communist Party apparatus, which had held the state together. By the end of 1988, one could say that he had broken the back of the communist regime. But the irony is that these very reforms exacerbated problems which were already there, but getting worse. One of them was economic, economic shortages. Just to give you a list of goods for which were in severe shortage already in 1989, if not unavailable, meat, sugar and sweets, toothpaste, soap and detergent, school notebooks, batteries, shoes, fur hats, coats, um, this kind of economic situation was beginning to undermine seriously the faith that people had originally had in Gorbachev and in the reforms he was carrying out. Nationalism was the second problem which was getting worse and worse. Beginning in 1986 in Kazakhstan, there had been riots when the Gorbachev regime tried to replace a corrupt Kazakh leader with an uncorrupt Russian, and the Kazakhs didn't like that. Then there were the Armenians and Azerbaijanis killing each other over the territory of Nagorno-Karabakh, which is in Azerbaijan, but populated mostly by Armenians. Then there was the troops, the troops massacre, massacring protesters in Tbilisi, capital of Georgia in 1989. The Baltics pressing harder and harder for independence and Ukrainians beginning to move in that direction and even stirrings of Russians wanting independence from the Soviet Union for Russia. And then the other pro problem that I was going to mention, which I already mentioned before, is the polarization. We know what polarization is in this country now. Well, they had it then. Gorbachev caught between the ever more radical Democrats who chose Boris Yeltsin as their political leader and the hardliners who wanted to reverse Gorbachev's reform, whereas Yeltsin and the Democrats wanted to make them go farther and faster. By 1990, there's some evidence that the so not only the Soviet Union was coming apart, but that Gorbachev himself was beginning to as well. And here I rely on the marvelous diary kept by Gorbachev's primary aid for both foreign affairs and to a somewhat lesser extent for domestic affairs, Anatoly Chernyayev, who just died last week at the age of 95. And Chernyayev describes two events in 1990, which led me to wonder whether Gorbachev wasn't coming apart. He describes Gorbachev attending the founding conference of the Russian Communist Party, to be distinguished from the Soviet Union's Communist Party. This was founded in 1990. Gorbachev didn't want it to happen because he was afraid it would turn into a vehicle for the hardline communists. Anyway, he attended, and as Chernyayev describes it in his diary, Gorbachev tolerated such abuse, even direct insults. He sat through so much nonsense, not even reacting to the most idiotic statements. He tried to defend himself, but was inundated with provocative, venomous, mocking, vulgar questions which he answered in a rambling, muddled manner, as if he were trying to ingratiate himself with an audience that simply loathed him. And then another event toward the end of the year, Gorbachev was addressing the USSR parliament, the Supreme Soviet, and this speech too, according to Chernyayev, was disastrous. Quote, he was unrecognizable. He simply mumbled. He rambled on. 
His listeners showed complete indifference, even contempt, unquote. Chernyayev, Yakovlev, and Yevgeny Primakov, another Gorbachev aide, were listening on the radio to Gorbachev's speech and were all distraught. They, they said to Chernyayev afterwards, what's happened to him? Why is he doing this? Vadim Medvedev, another man who had attended the session, said he's overburdened, embittered, confused. Yakovlev later took Chernyayev aside and totally distressed, whispered to him, he's done for. Gorbachev. Now I'm sure of it. Well, by 1991, Gorbachev didn't see that August coup coming. Um, I think I have a picture here. I don't remember what it is. Oh, I know it's later. This is after the coup. He didn't see the coup coming. He was still too confident that the hardliners who were going to try to oust him were not very gifted and he could control them. But they got him under house arrest for several days. He was rescued by Yeltsin. And afterwards, he was in effect doomed if he hadn't been doomed before it. And here's a picture of Yeltsin bullying Gorbachev at a meeting of the Russian Supreme Soviet after the coup had ended. Gorbachev at this point tried to cobble together a minimal union of eight of the former 15 republics as a confederation rather than a phony federation. But he failed, as I mentioned before, when Ukraine voted in that referendum for its independence. Uh, with that, if not before, the Soviet Union was finished. Gorbachev resigned on December 25th, 1991. On the same day, the Soviet flag was lowered. Well, what? What I say about Gorbachev as a whole, in retrospect, well, as you probably know, opinion in the world is divided. I think in the United States, he's still viewed as something of a hero, as a great statesman who brought about the end of communism and the Cold War. In, the, in Russia, he is despised, not by everyone, but by very many people. I remember once I was checking out at the airport in something like 1993, in Moscow, and just to make conversation with the woman who was going through my baggage, I said, I'm here writing a biography of Gorbachev. And this mild little old woman who was looking through my bags looked at me and snarled, I'd like to hang him from the nearest lamppost. <laughs> well, what should we say? What would I say about Gorbachev in retrospect? Um, I would say, he succeeded in, in destroying what was left of totalitarianism in the Soviet Union. He brought freedom of speech, of assembly, and of conscience to people who had never known it, except perhaps for a few chaotic months in 1917. By introducing free elections and creating parliamentary institutions, he laid the groundwork for democracy. And here I would say something that some of you may disagree with. I would say it is more the fault of the raw material he worked with than of his own real shortcomings and mistakes that Russian democracy will take much longer to build than he thought. He also ended the Cold War more than anyone else, reducing the danger of a nuclear holocaust. He allowed East European countries to become their own masters. He dismantled an empire or acquiesced in its dismemberment without the orgy of blood and violence that has accompanied the breakup of so many others. He was, I would say, a master politician when it came to consolidating his power, achieving power and consolidating it and using it to transform his country. He was not nearly as good a politician when it came to playing the game of democratic politics, which he had succeeded in bringing about. He let loose forces and people, he helped free these at home and abroad that eventually overwhelmed him in the end. I think in the end, the, the, I see him as a tragic hero, brought low in the end by his own shortcomings, but even more by the unyielding forces he faced. And now let me go back to um, Raisa and Mikhail. There's a picture of her a year or so before she died of leukemia in 1999. Unlike too many politicians, 
Gorbachev loved and cherished his wife. Unlike a lot of politicians or Soviet politicians, he was a committed and involved father and grandfather to his daughter and granddaughters. Yet after his wife died in 1991 at the age of 67, 1999, sorry, he said, and these are his words, I'm guilty. I'm the one who did her in. Politics captivated me, and she took it all too much to heart. If only our life had been more modest, she would be alive today. I know that's a sad note to end my talk on, but as I say, I do see him as a tragic hero. One may hail or regret, as Vladimir Putin does, the collapse of the Soviet Union, but in the end, I feel for Mr. Gorbachev, in part because of his sad personal life. He's still alive. Jane and I saw him in Moscow last June, and he's not in very good shape. Um, but he still was cheerful, still optimistic. He comes across as the decent, natural man that he actually is. I'll stop there. Try to answer questions or respond to comments if you have. What are we going to say, Gorbachev for president? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, just please, uh, you can just... I can call on people. Okay, I don't hear all that well, so I'm going to approach and ask you to speak loudly. Thank you, that was very lovely, and you brought wonderful memories from, from the past. I have a question, I have two questions, actually. What was the role of the Euro-communists at all in his thinking? The Euro-communists? Yes. Yeah. Because it seems that yes. several times, some of your expressions you used mm -hmm. were coming or were repeated by them. And why the Chinese experience was so much different than the Russian experience? Mm -hmm. Did you all hear him? Yes. Yeah. Okay, I think, can you hear me if I stand here? Yeah. The Euro communists, for those of you who don't know, were the communists in places like Italy and Spain, uh, less so in France. Uh, somewhat in Eastern Europe, who were Gorbachev before Gorbachev was Gorbachev. That is, they, they wanted change, they understood what was rotten about Stalinism. They were very important for Gorbachev. He began talking to them as early as, I think, his first contact with them was in 1971 at a Moscow youth festival. In the 1970s, he traveled to Western Europe several times, France, Italy, Germany. Um, Many of his closest aides, like Chernyayev, had been in Prague in the 60s working for a journal called Problems of Peace and Socialism. Uh, and they didn't learn their dissident views or their doubter views from that journal, but they learned it from the Euro communists who were also on the staff of that journal. And as a climbing the party ladder in Stavropol and being as he was for a while, they province party secretary, the boss of the province, he had access to books that were not for sale and that the elite could not have. And many of the elite, elite didn't bother with them, but he did. And he read Eurocommunists. He read Antonio Gramsci. He read Giuseppe Boffa, who was an Italian journalist. Uh, he read Roger Garodi, uh, Louis Aragon, so the Euro-communists were loomed very large in his mind and in his thinking. And the second question was, <laughs> what was it? China. Sorry? Why, why the Chinese experience? Oh, the Chinese. Well, ah, oh, the Chinese. Oh, the Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> I asked myself this question a lot, and I wish I knew more about the Chinese, because I know a lot of people have said, some at the time, and many since, that Gorbachev went wrong by not following something like the Chinese model, which I know enough to know involved economic reform while keeping the political lid on. Essentially, Gorbachev reversed the process, took the political lid off while the economic system changed very, very slowly. Uh, he thinks that, that he tried economic reform and it didn't work, and the reason was that the party bureaucrats were resisting it, and therefore they had to be undercut before he could proceed further. I'm not sure that's the case, but I certainly know enough to know that uh, 
Chinese history and Chinese traditions were different. The timing of the revolution was different. The state of the countryside was different. And so it's probably the case that had they tried it, it wouldn't have worked. Um, of course, there was an alternative to what Gorbachev tried, and that was keeping the lid on politically and not, and keeping the lid on economically too. And I suppose it's possible to believe, you know, you ask yourself, what would have happened if Gorbachev had been hit by a truck and killed um, and had not done all the things I just described him as doing? Well, most people would say the Soviet Union could have limped along, the regime could have limped along for 10, 20, 25 years, who knows? But if it had, it's quite plausible that it would have ended in a bl much bloodier mess. I mean, th there's been plenty of blood since, and of course the war between Russia and Ukraine is, is the latest. But still, it could have been even worse, like Yugoslavia. And, it, and if it wasn't, it was partly the way that Gorbachev did it. Yes, Valerie. Oh, she's gonna have a microphone, right? Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you for a great talk. So if we assume, and I think it's fair to assume this, that Gorbachev didn't want the Soviet Union to collapse, right? That wasn't what he wanted. Um, it seems, and if we think about the policies that he put in place, like Glasnost, so it wasn't Glasnost that wrecked the Soviet Union, right? It was, na it was nationalism at the end of the day, you know, as you pointed out, it, the situation was, the, the Soviet Union was set up uh, like that, you know, so that it, if it was gonna fall apart, it could fall apart into these national republics. And so I guess, you know, what, what, I, what I remember being taught in graduate school was that Gorbachev was sort of woefully naive about the nationalities. Um, and I guess what I would, and you know, some of the evidence that you that you provided makes that point. So you know, you replace Kunayev with uh, you know with the, with Kolbin, and those Cossacks go into the streets, and Gorbachev must have been terrifically surprised by that. And you have the anti-alcohol policy, and they plow up the vineyards in Nagorno-Karabakh, and next thing you know, the leaders of the movement for reunification with Armenia are springing up out of Nagorno-Karabakh. So he seems kind of uniquely clueless, I guess, about. Um, about the force of nationalism and specifically the force of, um, of nationalism within the Soviet Union. So I guess I, I'm curious as to why you think he, do you think he was naive about it? Do you think it was a calculated risk on his part? Did he just not think about it? Was Stavropol so white, uh, you know, that he didn't really have a, you know, have a lot of exposure despite being right next to the North Caucasus? Anyway, I'll-, I'll I, I agree that he was naive. I think he was very, very naive. Many people were, Maybe he more than most. It may have been a part of his optimism, his sense that people could get along if you just gave them the space to be fr freer than they were. That democracy was not the trouble, but the solution. Uh, and there were plenty of people around in his own circles in the Polipu who told him it was the trouble, not the solution. And that it was giving these people glasnost and democracy that allowed them to run amok. Uh, it may also have had to do with, with the area where he lived, which was pretty multinational. And uh, he got along well with those people and uh, thought they got along well with each other. And, but it was a, he, he was definitely naive, definitely naive. Not only about that, but I guess in retrospect, many other things. He's, he's accused by his critics of everything from naivete to treason. Uh, in fact, some even say he might have been an agent of the CIA, uh, which is crazy. They say Yakovlev was an agent of the CIA. I think that's crazy too. But there they have the fact that Yakovlev was an exchange student at Columbia University in 1968. And so they say you couldn't spend a year in New York without being corrupted. And, <laughs> and, 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 uh, but definitely naive. Yes, he was. Yes. With science and technology being so compartmentalized and um, kind of shrouded in secrecy and limited, how did they put a man on the moon 10 years before we did? I have, I used, I have a nasty joke that I used to, I, I, oh, I'm, I'm not joke. usually nasty. I, I know, you're so sweet. <laughs> I, this, my joke used to be that there were 75 people, I can't even bring myself to say it, but you'll forgive me. There were 75 people in the Soviet Union who knew what they were doing, and they built the Moscow subway, and they sent the rockets into space, 
but they couldn't be everywhere and do everything. <laughs> now that's not fair. They had brilliant scientists, especially theoretical scientists. They had Sergei Korolev, who was the, big, the genius behind the rocketry and who spent a good part of his time in prison before he was allowed out to organize the space program. Um, so they could do many things if they really, if they focused their energy and they focused their resources and they had a kind of crash campaign to do it. Uh, and they did it. Howard. During, uh, during our lifetimes, which are similar in length, um, there's a pattern that I think has always been there. And part of it is they, they don't seem able ever to com uh, produce consumer goods that anybody would really want to buy. Uh, and they've sort of lived conveniently off natural resources, which nowadays, you know, there, there's more <laughs> in the world than there used to be. So that's harder. But, but I'd just like to hear what you have to say about that. That, that seems to me to be true even now. Uh, that you know anybody who drives a Russian car or has a TV or a computer that's made in Russia? I mean, it's, they, they don't things are, things do are better that. now than they used to be. I mean, they, the stores are filled with stuff, not all of which is imported. Um, the trouble had to do with the crash program emphasis on heavy industry and the real almost total neglect of consumer goods. It had to do, and I'm not an expert on exactly on how the economy worked, maybe some of uh, people in the room who are emigres and who worked in the Soviet economy will know this better, but they used to have success indicators. It wasn't what you sold, it was the amount that you produced. It could be the weight of what you produced, you know. So they would produce one huge nail, you know, rather than many small nails. Uh, they, they just didn't care about that, the hell with that. And that's what they produced. I think now, you know, they're doing better because they have uh, enterprises which really work on these things. But that's the legacy and it's hard to get rid of it, not only as a, not, well, even as a tradition, even as a set of practices and habits of mine. Uh, by the way, I neglected to say there may be some Amherst College alumni in this room. Uh, oh, glad to see you, glad to see you. Um, I should call on one next, but there was a, somebody in the way, way back up there. Oh, yes. Um, so I was actually going to dovetail with Howard's uh, statement. Um, how much did the sort of crash in oil prices constrain Gorbachev's freedom to maneuver? I mean, there's a, there was a, I, I uh, grew up in Louisiana, and in the 80s, there was a huge crash in oil prices extended. The whole, I mean, my state lost population, and I think it was worse in Russia. So. My what's, question what's is the, what... How much of the, the what, the crash? In oil prices. Oil, oil price. Oh, yes, yes, yes. So in the 80s, you know, that would have been when he was trying to reform the economy. Yes. And it, I, I wondered to what extent did it constrain his, his options so he was, had to go the political route instead it of... It was devastating. Out. It was devastating. That, I mentioned the, the drop in the budget as a result of the anti-alcohol campaign. The, the drop in oil prices was horrible because a few years before that, when they were high, it was the high oil prices that really kept things going. And it was ironic that, that it, un it, it, it undercut him. And it wasn't only you know, the market. I think the Saudis, at the bidding of the Reagan administration, worked to reduce the price of oil to hurt the Soviets. There are lots of ways, I didn't go into this tonight at all, but it's a lot of it in my book. Lots of ways in which the United States, in particular in the West, uh, undercut Gorbachev. The first thing they did was uh, they doubted a lot of them, a lot of our leaders, not so much Reagan himself, who got very quickly to admire Gorbachev and think he could deal with him well, but Cheney, the vice president, well, Cheney was the vice president under Bush. I guess he was defense secretary under Reagan, if I'm not mistaken. Cap Weinberger, Cap Weinberger right, okay. Uh, Robert Gates, later the head of the CIA. Um, Scowcroft under Bush later, uh, even when Reagan and then Bush wanted to deal with Gorbachev, came to believe in him, they were kept being told by some of their advisors like Weinberger and others that Gorbachev might still be just a smiley-faced communist who hadn't proved himself. 
And this is really wrong because they were still saying this in 1988, 1988 and 1989. And if you look at what Gorbachev had done by 1988, 1999, he's getting out of Afghanistan, he's cutting back on the military, he's endorsed freedom of choice in his speech at the UN in Come December. Freedom of religion. Freedom of religion. And these guys, or at least some of them are saying, don't trust him. And in 1989, was the, really the, the, the missed opportunity because in 1989, he was still by far the most popular leader in the Soviet Union. Uh, and he was beginning to encounter trouble and he was hoping that Bush would pick up from where Reagan had left off. Reagan, the arch conservative, had vouched for him. Reagan had told him that he was gonna make sure that Bush followed in his footsteps when they met in December 1988 at Governor's Island. And Bush had promised Gorbachev that he would and, and told Gorbachev to ignore whatever he might have said that sounded otherwise in his presidential campaign. And then Bush came in and declared a pause, a pause, P-A-U-S-E, not P-A-W-S. Anyway, <laughs> um, and, and it didn't really resume. The next summit wasn't until December in Malta. And so the, that was the time they could have given Gorbachev a hand and they, they they really didn't. So what's the missed opportunity there exactly? What, so sorry? people talk about this, like Stephen Cohen talks about this, and various other people talk about these missed opportunities sort of preventing the breakup of the Soviet Union. Or, and it, it's unclear to me what the missed opportunity is there exactly. Well, like what, because it was relatively bloodless, a collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, so what's the precise missed opportunity or what could Gorbachev have accomplished if the Soviet Union hadn't collapsed? What's the, I mean, obviously things haven't turned out well now, but what was the opportunity then where things could have turned well, out I better? Well, can't, I can't really tell you what he would have accomplished if it hadn't collapsed, but we know what he was trying to do. He was trying to save a Soviet Union that would be democratic and really, in effect, social democratic. He was trying to turn the Soviet Union into a genuine federation, even if without the Baltic states and, uh, perhaps Georgia and a couple of others. Uh, I won't say he would have turned it into Sweden. That's a different country, a different people, a different culture, a different tradition. But that's sort of what he was trying to do. And I've asked myself, frankly, as, as one looks at Trump and Putin and wonders whether they will have a summit after all of the hacking and all of the accusations, Trump, who may have wanted that now, has to face the fact that any deal he makes with Putin will immediately be you know, condemned as having occurred because Putin's got control over him. But until all of that started happening, I was kind of hoping that they would get together and make a deal of some sort. You'd have to describe what it is. Um, but in retrospect, the best partner for the United States in the Soviet or Russian Imperium was Gorbachev. Yeltsin turned out to want to cooperate and tried very hard, but he was inconsistent, erratic, drunk half of the time. Putin, we know, is very, very different. Gorbachev was the one. Now, you know, again, the, the reason they didn't cooperate with him was on the one hand, they didn't trust him, and I think that can be shot down immediately. The other was they were afraid that he wouldn't last. And that is a genuine concern in retrospect, because we can see him running into trouble, running into trouble. But the other time it came up was in 1990-91. Gorbachev wanted big Marshall Plan size aid from the West. He could barely bring himself to ask for it because it was so humiliating. But on a couple of occasions, the, occasions, the record shows that his aides uttered the sum of $60 billion, and he didn't get it. He got a lot from the Germans in return for approving their reunification and uh, continuation in NATO. He got much less from the Americans. Uh, Bush and his people said, we have a budgetary problem of our own. There's one conversation between Baker and Gorbachev, which I quote in the book, in which Gorbachev is trying to bring himself to ask and Baker is offering him a million, I mean a billion, one billion, and 
Gorbachev is pushing for a little more, and Baker says something like, you better take a billion now, or you won't get even that. So I don't want to be naive myself and imagine that that kind of big money would have saved the day. There were too many ways in which money could have gone down the drain, down the toilet in the Soviet Union. But as Margaret Thatcher said at that time, by which time she was out of office, she said, look how many people died to destroy Nazism, to destroy Hitler and Nazi Germany. Look how much money was spent. Look at the millions who died. And Gorbachev did this for us with communism. So we should at least go all out to try to do it. And Jack Matlock, who was the American ambassador to Russia at the time, says too, I can see the risks. It might have gone down the drain, but we didn't really try. And that's sad, as Trump would tweet, sad. <laughs> uh, yes? Thank you. Um, I was wondering about the economic causes of the, the fall of the Soviet Union, because you, uh, I felt you, you, you spoke about the shortages of, like, of food and of certain items. Um, but I felt you put more of an emphasis on the political causes, uh, the nationalism, and so on. And I was wondering if you felt like the political was uh, paramount, I mean, superior to the economic causes. For instance, yeah, I don't I'm know, like the. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry. So, so far, so yeah. my, my problem, my problem. No, <laughs> no worries. Are you French? Hmm? Are you French? Yes. Ah, oh, bien sûr. Oh, oh. No, I don't speak French. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so you, the, this um, the young woman is asking about the economic causes, but the economic causes, uh, and what role they played in the collapse. Of yes, the I mean, would you say the the political causes were more important than the economic causes okay. in the in the fall of yeah, the union? Yeah, the political causes more important than the economic and the fall of the Soviet Union. Well, it's complicated. I mean, the economic. Uh, situation in 1985, the st economic stagnation was so bad and palpable that it generated the desire on the part of even some of the tough guys in the Politburo for reform. I don't think they were motivated initially by the sense that we don't have enough free speech or enough de freedom or democracy. No, they, they thought the economy was growing too slowly and goods were too scarce, and so reform was needed. And Gorbachev then began those reforms, and as I mentioned a few minutes ago, the first reforms didn't produce much, in part because I, reforms that I didn't even mention were sort of contradictory and half measures. Uh, so he then resorted to political change, which then not only didn't solve the economic problem, but made it worse. Um, so it was both, but probably, um, if I had to choose one rather than the other, I would say the political changes really broke up the system. Thanks. And Amherst Stallone, yes. Yeah. I said I regret something having been here tonight that I never took a course with you. And I, I, uh, well, I'm not sure what you that. missed. <laughs> well, I think I'm beginning to learn. Um, so, be that as it may. Um, is there much of a spirit today of entrepreneurship in, in Russia, do, do they have the, because I, I still, you know, I'm from way back. Do they, are they still, do they still have the democratic um, impetus to succeed the, the average person in the street? Because I've always felt, and as our French young lady just was asking, there's, there's a large degree, I think, in my understanding of history, of economic opportunism and lack of opportunism that dictates how nations ultimately behave or how leaders evolve. So what's going on in Russia today? <laughs> <laughs> there may be people in the audience who know more than I do about that, because when I go to Russia, which I often do, it's usually to try to talk to Gorbachev about what was happening back then. Yeah. Um, but I, I live there, you know, and walk around and go to stores. There's an awful lot of economic activity. Young people, when, in the old days, when we would go there, among the young people we knew, children of the intelligentsia, the idea of, say, spending some time working as a salesperson in a store over the summer, no way. I mean, that was many of the things that 
American kids would do to make some money over the summer was beneath them. They didn't want to do it. Nowadays, people are into business, business, into the economic activity. There are entrepreneurs who are who are very uh, enterprising, very. Not, not all crooks. What? They're not all crooks. Not all crooks. No, but a lot of them are. Uh, <laughs> there's tremendous corruption, and I think those who are are that way in part because that's what you have to do. We had we had some friends, Jane and I, who were. Uh, scientists who worked for a the ministry that supervised the production of medical equipment and when the Soviet Union collapsed they did what a lot of people did they sort of took over what they were the material they were working with the labs they were working with and set up a enterprise a private enterprise uh, not just themselves but all the workers cooperated and um, they've done quite well but they've done quite well, I think, by keeping their head down, by not trying to get too big, by being as honest as they possibly can be. And I prob they probably don't tell us when, they're not, when they can't afford to be honest and they have to connive and pay people off. But it's a very different place now uh, in the sense that there is a lot of private activity, private enterprise. Less so now under Putin that the state has regained control of many of the largest uh, enterprises, and Putin has put his colleagues from the KGB days in charge of them, managing these huge enterprises for the state. But it's, a very, it's quite a different place, unrecognizable in some ways. Yes? Um, so I have a question. Like, do you have any idea what Gorbachev's opinions right now about Putin and what is happening in Russia right now when it comes to political situation? Gorbachev's opinion? Yes. Of Putin, yeah. Well, I have been shocked and disappointed at first to discover that Gorbachev, after, well, it's complicated. Let's go back. When, when Gorbachev left office, Yeltsin was the president, and they were longtime enemies. And for the first 10 years that, that Yeltsin was president, he treated Gorbachev very badly, and Gorbachev hated him and criticized him. When Putin came in, I think Gorbachev was pleased to see somebody other than Yeltsin. Uh, and he spoke very highly of him. He even went, I thought, too far in saying a certain amount of authoritarianism is now necessary and democracy will take longer to achieve than he had thought. Uh, after a while, as, as Putin became more author even more authoritarian, Gorbachev began to criticize him. And if, in fact, some of his criticism got pretty rough. He would compare the uh, Putin's political party to the Communist Party in, for all the wrong, you know, re, all, all the, all the uh, bad features about both. But even then, he continued to be sort of mixed in his view of Putin. And the other thing that was very interesting was on foreign policy, he began to sound exactly like Putin. Putin made a famous speech in 2007 at the Munich Security Conference in which he laid out his critique, blasting the United States and the West for everything. And Gorbachev has come pretty close to saying the same things. Um, I wondered about that because um, some of the things that Gorbachev criticizes the West for are the things that the West did at the time when he, Gorbachev, was in power and seemed to be willing to go along with it. Um, so I think Gorbachev has been brought around to a much more skeptical, if not cynical, view of the West than the one he had at the time. That's partly due to the fact that he believes that the West wasn't straight with him at the time. One big issue is NATO expansion. I've actually read the transcripts of the Baker Gorbachev talks in which Baker says that if Germany is allowed to remain, United Germany to remain in NATO, NATO's military jurisdiction will not move one inch to the east. Well, we know that it's moved a lot more than one inch right up to the borders of the Baltics and, and Russia. Uh, so Gorbachev feels betrayed, just as Putin does. But I think 
what's really, I mean, my guess would be that what's going on as well as, as the things I've just mentioned is that Gorbachev desperately wants to be respected by the president of Russia. And he doesn't want to break entirely with Putin. And when Medvedev came in for that one term, he was, he was much happier about Medvedev, and they got along indeed very well. So it's a complicated, one other personal anecdote. In 19, well, for Gorbachev's 75th birthday, 1980, 19, what was it, 90s? No, 2006, I think. Anyway, we went to Moscow, and we went to the party, which took place at a banquet hall on Leninsky Prospect called Napoleon. And a lot of big shots came, but Putin didn't come. And a few weeks earlier, Yeltsin had had his 75th birthday, and Putin came and probably paid for it. So Putin went out of his way to be nice to Yeltsin, who had made him president, and not so nice to Gorbachev. So the personal enters into it as well. Sir, yes. Gorbachev at all had a chance to read parts of your book. Gorbachev uh, read my Khrushchev book in Russian. It came out in Russian. And he's rather chary about praise. He said, good solid work, good solid work. Um, he hasn't read this book, but his, his English interpreter, Palaschenko, has read it. And Palaschenko is very close to him. And I frankly was a little worried about what would happen. You know, Palaschenko might tell Gorbachev it's not very good. So I waited until it was almost done to tell him. And Palaschenko wrote me back a long letter. And his first sentence was, your research is, I'm, I'm reaching for the words there in English because his English is so good. Your research is enormous and meticulous and your views are your own. <laughs> <laughs> and that, what that meant was he wasn't going to argue with me about my views, but he was going to correct my mistakes, for which I was very grateful. Yeah. Thank you, sir. We have a lot of students here. I want to know how you got into this field originally. What attracted you to the Soviets and the Russians? The question is whether I can remember that far back. <laughs> well, I grew up in the 50s. I went to high school in the 50s. And I remember several things. One, the Cold War was really on. The Soviet leader was Khrushchev, who was a colorful character. He was jousting with Eisenhower and then Kennedy. I was just fascinated. I was kind of a news junkie, and I was watching what was going on. The other thing was my grandfather on my mother's side were born in Nikolaev. Uh, and they spoke Russian. My mother did not. But that must have influenced me in ways that I wasn't quite aware of. And then the other thing that went on that I remember was that my, I had relatives on my mother's side who, despite everything, seemed to think highly of Joseph Stalin. And I had somehow gotten the idea that he was a mass murderer. <laughs> and so I couldn't quite figure out you know, what, how to put this together. And I began to wonder whether the evil that he did came out of Lenin and Marx before him, or whether he had perverted what Lenin had begun inspired by Marx. And so when I got to college, I started studying Russian, and I started taking Russian history, and I started looking at questions that if you want to find the answers to today, take Nina's courses. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much.